Hi guys, Chris Martin here. We're doing our recap of the World Diplomacy Championships at Weasel Newt in Chicago. We are now up to spring 1902 and this is an amazing turn. So much happens. We're going to focus a little bit more on the analysis this turn and a little bit less on the diplomacy uh, because there's such a rich, rich trove of things to look at there. But let's not ignore the diplomacy. Let's start by looking at uh, Dave Moletsky as he breaks down to Chris Brand how he sees his opening position playing out. Well, I feel very confident uh, that in the current situation, unless I hear something uh, particularly aggressive out of uh, Jurgen or Goff, which is to date not happen, that um, you will have strategic freedom to do whatever, um, because my fleet is probably going to be bouncing not infinitum with Peter's fleet in the Aegean and with Goff's fleet in the So, that fun. Yes, it, it does sound super fun. I would, would love nothing more than to write standing orders starting in 1902 on the top board of the World Championships. Um, but, but uh, yeah, so I think if you wanted to go against Austria or uh, France, you're probably it's probably going to have be like you're going to have an infinity of time to do so. So, um, I am perfectly happy if uh, at any point I'm able to support a convoy of yours in the Greece, That's fine, like, you know. So, but that's us. At, at least a ways off since I will find it difficult to exit the yeah. Okay. Okay. For me, the important thing to, to see there is that Dave feels like he's really locked in, that uh, he's going to be bouncing in the Black Sea, bouncing in the Aegean, and that's all the hope he has for the immediate future. A lot of turkeys uh, can make a really good play from that position, but like on the World Championship, he's saying he'd like to have a little more dynamism. But what a good listener Chris Brand is. He just doesn't need to offer anything, he just takes it all in. Well, in our next conversation, he talks to Nathan Barnes. And this is important because Italy and France have to make decisions about which way they're going and what choices they're going to make. And interestingly, for each of them, they think they have a hard choice. But they think the other person has a pretty easy choice. Let's hear how they break it down for each other. He might just throw dots because he's deciding that you want somebody else. That's the kind of player. Jurgen's not that player. No, Jurgen's definitely not. I agree with you. If you have a choice, can be. Yeah, that's real. Jurgen has your dots, and what's going to have a chance of getting So Nathan has said, your game is better if you do Austria. You know, Peter has your dots, and Maletsky is enough of a wild card that he might just decide to throw you dots if he decides you played the right game. And that's not something that Peter will do. And Chris Brand kind of not. Now he's going to turn it around and break it down for Nathan. Your choice, I think, is easier for some people. I don't think it's as hard either for either reason. Yeah. Actually, what's your if it was anyone else in Germany, I wouldn't be as worried. Worrisome, yeah. Most most Germany, six hundred Germany. So what Chris is very quietly saying there is that um, you can take Silverman down later with Goff's help, right? And Nathan's like, well, yes, but, you know. And he says, yeah, okay. Normally, anybody else in Germany, you don't worry about it. But it's Doug Moore. Put Doug Moore at six centers in Germany, and he's going to be impossible to dig out. And Nathan is like, yeah, yeah, he doesn't like it, but it looks like the conclusion that he's coming to here. And that makes our next conversation important. This is the one we're going to focus on for the longest time here. It's Nathan and Adam trying to work out how they're going to divide Belgium and where they're going to go from here. Let's take a look. 
Doug is trying to fulfill the prophecy. Yeah. Doug is trying to make himself fulfill the prophecy. He's not even talking. All he's doing is coming after me. Yes. You know, he's just offered me. He's offered me nothing. He's just. He's determined. That's what's He's kind of, but it's. It's like it feels almost like a self fulfilling prophecy, and I don't know that. That's what has to. Oh yeah. In case you missed that uh, transition at the beginning, they're talking about what to do about Doug, and Adam is saying it feels like Doug just has decided that I'm going to attack him, and it's become this self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, who can we blame for that? Maybe we can lay some of the blame at the feet of Peter Jurgen, who worked pretty hard to plant those seeds way back in spring of 1901, and then he watered them in the fall, and here they are bearing fruit as Germany and England have no chance of getting anything together. So, how are Nathan and Adam going to move forward together now that they've decided that that's what Adam has to do? So, what's the figure on the top of the floor? Okay. Um, it's more of a, what do you want to do? Uh, the question is, um, I'm almost tempted to go to, well, if you want to have no chance of making it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, well, it's just like a waste of money. Well, otherwise, I think Oh, because you'd have, because you're a public car boy. Or you can let me go to the channel now, and I said, well, that's the way to do that. So, or whatever. I'm going to try to the channel. So, the move that Nathan suggests is let's support your army in to Belgium. And that's what Adam wants, right? Should be really easy. But then they turn to the question of what do we do about the fleets in the English Channel? And uh, Nathan says, well, we can, uh, we don't want to waste the tempo bouncing. I hate wasting that time. And Adam's like, well, then my fleet in London just sits there. And so they go around and around and around about this. And you can see that they don't really like, well, I would say Nathan really doesn't like the conclusion that he's coming to about what happens when he supports that army in. Let's see what they go to next. I mean, if you're not going, if you're not positioning your fleets anyway, it's probably the thing to do. Okay. Yeah, I also said to I don't like it. I don't like it either. I'd rather get it out, but... Yeah. Uh, do, 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 I'm open to other options. I know, I know. I'm, I'm standing here trying to think of other options. I can put my in. I want to say... Belgium, but it's not terribly. It's not terribly. It's not terribly. Well, it depends on what I think Doug's going to do. Well, eventually there's going to be. Do you have a strong preference on one or the other? Do you think the army is scared of the In the short term, no. In the long term, probably. But, you know, I don't think anybody, there's nothing that seems to be happening in the long term as of right now. So I'm fine. I mean, I'm okay to do that. Oh, it's, it's a little weird. I'll get you that. But it's also, we're wasting units in the channel. Again, though, what are your fleets doing other than Well, the, the other thing I, I was tempted to go and just put it in Spain South Coast, like, put it in Mao, and just kind of being like, hey guys, we've got this covered over here, let us focus on our thing. That's, that's what I would do. That's okay. So, if, if. But if we can bounce spring and do that in the fall, which doesn't really lose any tempo. Right? Because in the fall, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. If I'm gonna be so worried for well actually I can't because I still need to be able to support myself. I guess if Doug Doug's gonna change the Yes. Each empty land space can hold up to two animals of each type, but on empty land spaces they do not breed. They only So you can see they're going around in circles. Uh put the fleet in. No, don't put the fleet in. Hey, bouncing in the channel doesn't cost us anything. You know, if you're just moving your fleets, says Adam. And Nathan's like, yeah, okay, that's true. Uh, well, what does it matter in the long term? Well, it seems to me that they don't have a goal that they are talking about beyond securing Belgium. They are not talking about what is the best way to dismantle Doug Moore. How do we best put our units into position to make that happen? Instead, they're talking about the dot. And they're not doing that because they aren't great players. 
they're doing that because they don't want to have that next conversation because that would mean committing emotionally uh, to that project of dismantling Doug Moore. And you can tell that neither of them are super crazy about that. Uh, it's almost done here. Let's just look how they close this down and what they come to at the end of the conversation. I'll put the fleet on. I feel like the fleet's only going to be better just because I'll of the way we're positioned. Don't, I mean, don't you. About two minutes down. So after all of that, he's going to put the fleet in. That's what they've come to. Is it going to be fleet North Sea to Belgium? And Burgundy supports that. And London's going to go to the North Sea. There's no agreement to bounce in the channel. And uh, as they walk away from that, you can kind of hear Andrew Goff walks up and grabs Adam Silverman. Now, this is, for my money, the negotiation of the game. This is the most important conversation of all of the conversations that I record over the course of the entire game because such an important pivot point happens right here. So check this out. This is, this is for me, really amazing. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, let me just write some orders. Yes, you have a plan for Norway. Supporting myself out to the Nets. Okay. The carpenter is going to turn Oh, I'd rather not be kind of pushed out this on the phone. I think what Doug is telling me is not this guy. I certainly don't want to scat for action. I'm not going to screw you. I actually wouldn't really like you to do that if that's what you think he's doing. I got my sheet. That's bad for both of us. He may now walk into Sweden. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out if he does that. Yeah, I'll just give it to you and try and set him on fire. Well, that was a lot of setup for uh, such a short conversation. What is it that I think is so important? Goff comes to him and says, what are you doing with Norway? He says, yeah, I am supporting myself out from London to the North Sea. And he talks about the fleet. He says, okay, because Doug Moore tells me he's going to Skagerrak. And Adam blinks and goes, are you going to bounce him? Goff says, are you going to screw me? And so we have this conversation here where Goff and uh, Adam suddenly are kind of aligned on a common target here. And Goff says, hey, you know, don't walk into Sweden behind me. And if Doug walks into Sweden, you know, I'll probably give it to you and try and light him on fire. And you can hear in the background, 15 seconds to deadline. So this is really last minute stuff. And uh, the effect that this conversation is going to have on the rest of the game just continues to get larger and larger as the game goes on. What we really miss in the negotiations this season is anything from Peter Jurgen. What is he going to do? We've got Goff with all these armies. We've got Peter with all these armies. We've got Chris Brand and his army sticking around. And we know that Dave Moletsky feels like, well, he's pinned down in the Black Sea. He's pinned down in the Aegean. How's it going to play out? Uh, let's hear the orders read. You made it! I made it. Paris to Picardy, Spain to Gascony, Brest to the Channel, Portugal to Mao, Burgundy to Belgium. Warsaw to Galicia, Moscow to Ukraine, Ukraine to Romania, Romania to Serbia, is it possible to black, Sweden to Skagra. Juncture uh, holds, London to North, Norway supports London to North. North? London to North, Yorkshire holds, London to North, Norway supports London to North. Oh, good. Okay. Naples the Ionian, Napoleon to Venice, Venice to Tyrolia, Naples the Ionian. I'm sorry, that is what it says and not what I read. Uh, Berlin to Munich, we're to Belgium, Holland supports, we're to Belgium. Kiel to Denmark, Denmark to Scott. <laughs> Vienna to Budapest, Budapest to Serbia, she has supports Budapest to Serbia, Serbia to Bulgaria, Greece supports Serbia to Bulgaria. Smyrna to the Aegean, Bank to Black, Khan supports Bull, Bull supports Rwanda to Serbia. 
Okay, so much going on there. Let's start by looking at England. England essentially orders an NMR. He gets nothing done. Adam Silverman, trying to write his orders with Nathan, gets pulled over, is distracted by Goff. And what Goff has to say, and there's no time left, and this is drop dead, so he's got 15 seconds. He runs in, puts his orders in the box, and he has nothing. Which it turns out didn't matter, because he wasn't moving anyway. Even if he had ordered North Sea to Belgium, Nathan didn't support that. Nathan ordered Burgundy to Belgium himself. At the same time, moving to the Channel, moving to the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. So he gets this, this big push north. Doug tries to sneak his fleets north. Skagrak and Denmark, lining up on the North Sea, lining up on Sweden. He's trying to have his cake and eat it too, and Goth stuffs him. He does get Belgium, but because he started in Berlin and not in Munich, he's in a slightly tougher position to maybe hold and keep it. Down here in the Balkans, this is all a big bounce. The supported attack uh, from Romania to Serbia doesn't work because there was a supported attack from Budapest to Serbia. Uh, Peter does not succeed in getting into Bulgaria because Bulgaria was supported to hold. Now, De Maletsky does get into the Aegean, and Chris Brand rotates his armies around. So, look at what the rest of the board does after these orders are read. There's so much going on that these guys just look at the board. Check it out. Uh, sorry uh, about you, that. Um, why didn't you get into Serbia? He supported himself. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah. I screwed him. He was trying to line up Romania. It's the way of the world. Okay, so here's our new map after those orders have been read, and this is what they're looking at and figuring out. Um, what we see here, what I note, is that we've got a three on two here. Uh, as far as Belgium is concerned, if France decides he's going to force Belgium, he can probably do that. Uh, England loses a little bit if France really keeps coming up on him. Germany loses a lot of tempo with those fleets not moving. That's going to hurt him in the long run. And look, again, we've got these armies here, but uh, Goff loses a lot of tempo by trying to chain these through. Moscow to Ukraine, Ukraine to Romania, when nothing moves, that's a lot of pieces just still holding still. On the other hand, look at Peter Jurgen's position. Absolutely nothing ended up moving. And now he's got one, two, well, really two new units in the north against him and two new units possibly against him in the south. Very interesting stuff here. Uh, Going to be really interesting to see what they do in the fall of 1902 to try and resolve this and get some momentum moving forward. I'm looking forward to hearing about it. I hope you are too, and I'll catch you then.